Thank you very much. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce Stanley Krippner. Just a little biography background. He is formerly the Alan Watts Professor of Psychology at Saybrook University in Oakland, California. He is the co-author of Extraordinary Dreams and How to Use Them and Haunted by Combat, Understanding PSD and Veterans and the co-editor of Varieties of Anomalous Experiences, Examining the Scientific Evidence. Now, I have to say that of all the books, and I do have it right here, my book is the favorite one, is The Mysterious Minds. And I would just, as a personal introduction, like to say that when I first got interested in doing parapsychological research, Stanley's name was the one that first came up and I got this book and this was my introduction to the subject. And now that I'm doing research in the area, it is now becoming a citation in my own work. Mother so it is a great pleasure that I'm here today to introduce Stanley Krippner. Thank you so much, thank you. Well, we are going to have a very unique exploration today and I'm going to be sharing the stream with a very short PowerPoint that we have planned. And this whole episode came about when I was contacted through the internet by a woman who we're going to call Amanda. None of these names, of course, will be the real names. And she's an events planner for the U.S. Army. So let's have her picture on the PowerPoint. Can we do that? There she is down on the lower left. Yes. yes, but I'm going to get you a bigger picture of her. And she has had a very interesting career of dreaming, dreaming about religious themes, future events, family members who have passed on, lucid dreams where she knew that she was dreaming. And on top of that, her grandmother is Native American descent. This is of interest because she worked with a chaplain who's Native American, and we'll see him in the next slide. Now, we're going to name him Wink, again, not his real name. But she was having these interesting dreams. And so she began to talk to Wink about the dreams. And he went back to the tribal, uh, tribal elders and the shamans in the tribe and said, why am I not having these dreams? They're about people who I knew. And they say, no, you do not have the gift of discernment. And Amanda does have the gift of discernment. Okay, so let's have the next slide. And we'll have case number one. We're going to go very quickly through 12 different cases. Amanda dreamed that she was in an American Legion building, playing bridge with two ladies, one in the 50s, the other one, the mother of the first. The lady showed her a lanyard with the ID name Sanchez. On the other side of the ID, was a picture of a rattlesnake with a knife through it. Now, the next slide will tell you how Wink was so surprised. He had a friend, Jeremy Sanchez, who was killed in the Middle East. And Jeremy's only surviving family was his mother and grandmother. Jeremy had been trying out for a special operations unit and the symbol was a rattlesnake with a sword in its tail. So look at that. We have three different correspondences in that one dream. And they would have made no sense at all to Amanda, but when she told them to wink, they made perfect sense. Okay, this sets the pattern for the other dreams that are to come. So let's go on to case number two. This time Amanda dreamed about a man sitting on a sofa and Amanda told him about her job and about Wink, the assistant chaplain. He added to Amanda a file with the name Bandrews on it. Very strange. Okay, move on. Next slide. Now, Wink said his friend, Britt Andrews, had been killed. Britt's file should have been labeled B.R. Andrews, but because of a clerical error, it was labeled Bandrews. See, this is very, very specific, letter for letter. And many people think this is all coincidental. Hard to ascribe this to coincidence when things are so very specific. All right, let's move on to case number three. 
Now, group number three was about a group of guys in a college dormitory. One said his name was Larry. One said his name was Adam. One said he was Patrick. He had a girl sitting on his lap. Amanda said she was looking for another Patrick. Move on to the next slide. All three names were people Wink knew who had been killed. All of these people had been killed in Afghanistan, Iraq. All of these people so far are soldiers that Wink knew personally. Larry and Adam were killed in improvised device attacks and traumatic circumstances. And Wink knew of two Patricks, one of whom kept a photo with a picture of his fiance on his lap. Again, remarkable how everything checks out. Okay, case number four. This time, Amanda dreamed about Wink helping a man climb up a wall and into Amanda's bedroom. Wink knew the man was dead. The man sat on the floor and was joined by a woman and two kids. Wink pointed out scars on the right side of the man's face. Next slide. Wink says, the man sounds like my friend Evan Green. He died after he climbed up a wall. He had two children. He had a glass right eye and scars on the right hand side of his face. So either Winker's making all of this up or he's actually describing people who were definitely uh, people he knew that were involved in the dream. Now we're gonna hold the slides for just a few minutes because I'm gonna briefly describe the other dreams for you and so that you get the whole picture. I think that many of your viewers are probably quite intrigued and interested because very rarely you get a collection of evidential dreams like this. Case number five, a man who was talking to a man who was killed in the US invasion of Panama to topple Noriega, the strongman dictator, wearing old green army uniform. He said his name was Jesse. He gave a man the medical advice for a friend who had PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, Wick did not know of anybody by the name of Jesse. They went and looked up the records. They found out that very, very few Americans were killed in the invasion of Panama. But one of the people who was killed was a medic, could give medical advice, and his name indeed was Jesse. Again, direct correspondence. Okay. This was the only one of the dreams that Wink did not know. Now we will move on to case number five. Again, there's no slides for these. I'm just reading from my notes. Wink and I are looking at a map of Arizona to see where he's going to go when he visits his home. We see a town named Abuela. Later, we are there with Wink's mother and another older woman who gave Amanda a small brown box with a white rosary, a book with a rosary inside. I cannot read the book and gave it back to her. Well, she did not read it because it was in Spanish. Wink revealed that his mother had recently sent him a photo of her grandmother, Abuela, of course, a Spanish for grandmother, who had raised her. She always carried a book with her while his mother assumed it was a Bible. And in the photo, there was a white rosary, just as it was in the dream. By the way, any of you who want to read the complete story, here it is in the Journal of the Society for Psychical Research, a complete listing of all of the evidence, all of the dreams. In the meantime, we'll go on to case number seven. Amanda said, I had been paying laser tag with a ranger who had a tattoo on the back of his neck. I woke up and I text Wink, who he said he knew no ranger with a neck tattoo. I went back to sleep and dreamed about Wink coming into my room looking angry as if he was about to choke me. Well, Wink reported that after the phone call, he had a dream. And in the dream, it's like he were choking Amanda. And that night, his daughter had a nightmare. And Amanda's dog barked and woke everybody up. So this is a very interesting night of disturbances and 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 share dreams. You say a dream is shared when two people dream about the same thing the same night, and Amanda and Wink really seem to have had a shared dream that particular night. Okay, we'll move on now to case number eight. 
Amanda said, I was at Starbucks drinking coffee with Wink, telling him about a memorial I had visited with a branch for each service member. And there was a name Terrace in the Marines section of the memorial. Wink told Amanda that he did not know any Marine who was killed on duty. And she had not given him any more names at this time. So Amanda herself did a search for a Marine killed in the Middle East. And the first name she came about was Lance Corporal Jeremy Terrence, killed in Iraq. She thought that she had better bring that news to Wink. And he said, oh, good heavens, I didn't know he was a Marine. But he was one of the dead bodies that I put in the body bag, body bag and had to fill out the records for. And indeed, the Lance in the dream came into the reality. Terrace in the dream also came into the reality. Again, remarkable how specific these names are. All right, now we move ahead to case number nine, case number 10. These are complicated dreams, and so I've combined them. But the net effect is that these were dreams that were very unpleasant to Amanda because there was a woman who was going through Iraq and Afghanistan looking for bodies of dead soldiers, and she was collecting them. And she uh, had a very, very unpleasant duty. Well, when Wink found out about this, he consulted his tribal elders, and they said, look, you'd better have Amanda do a clearing okay. of the negative energy. And she took sage and cleared the uh, house that she was living in so that there would be no carryover from that very unpleasant dream. All right, now we're going to dream number 11. And Amanda was with Wink, and he was engaged with an Operation Naval SEALs, the special unit. There was a pie sign on a bridge that had dropped down to the terrorists into a tower of travel, a tower level. Wink shot at the sign, and the bridge fell, hitting the terrorists and killing them. And then he and the others went looking for the bodies. Wink affirmed that he had been involved in a SEAL operation with a SEAL by the name of Nick. He survived the first operation, but not the second one, sad to say. During the second operation, Nick had thrown himself over a grenade to save the, wink of li of the life of Wink and the other soldiers. The pie sign was very similar to the Roman numeral two, which was on the bridge. And so the symbol in the dream did correspond to a similar symbol in reality. This, of course, was a very, very dramatic incident, and it served as the plot line for a movie, which I happen to see, a very good movie, Act of Valor. Now we go to the last case, case number 12. In this dream, Amanda was in a room with a man with dark hair in his late 30s. It was a living room of a house, and Wink was not there, but a boy with dark hair entered the room. The man doubled up as if he had been hit by something. Someone said the boy had a tumor and that it was a good thing that the father uh, did not see his son die. Well, in reality, Wink replied that the soldier's name was Hathaway. They never met, but he had to bring the bad news about Hathaway's death to the family and who should he run into but the boy. The boy himself was dying of cancer, and the boy hit Wink in the stomach and said, you have killed my father. Of course, that was nonsense, but uh, children behave irrationally when they're confronted with great tragedies like this. And soon after that incident, yes, indeed, the boy uh, did die of a tumor. And then Wink was transferred to South Korea, and so we're lucky that we have these 12 dreams, as I said before, in great detail, they're written up in this particular journal, Journal of the Society for Psychological Research. So now we'll go back to the PowerPoint and move on to the next slide, please. All of them were about deceased persons that Wink had known or had known of. 
Wink was in most of the battles in which they were, had been killed. They always appeared alive and healthy in the dream. Why did they come to a manager and not Wink? Well, maybe it was his guilt about their deaths, but more likely it was, as the elder said, he just was not a good receiver. He had to work with somebody like Amanda, who had a long history of uh, unusual dreams, and she apparently was a good receiver because on one occasion that the deceased loved one had come to her in a dream. And the fact that they were both in contact with each other is really quite remarkable. Also the fact that Amanda had some Native American background in her genealogy provided a link, again, a link between her and with Wink. Okay, so now let's go on to the next slide. How do what will you make all of this? Well, as I said before, it could be fraud. They could be playing a joke on me. They could be trying to get away with something. And they might be laughing at the present time, uh, knowing that I am on radio and um, uh, spreading their, their spreading their news. But why would they engage in fraud three years ago and not have embarrassed me by this time? So the motive is really puzzling. Also, they came to visit me when I was in the state of Virginia at a conference at a near-death experience uh, program. They came a day too late. I left the day before I came. But they introduced themselves to colleagues of mine who interviewed them. My colleagues said that they seemed to be authentic. And I actually had a long Skype interview uh, in which I could actually see Wink. And so it's not like we had no contact, but we didn't have face-to-face -face contact. So we did our best to work around the fraud possibility. And again, many people, maybe some of them listening to the program, are saying, oh, yes, this is all fraud. They're probably laughing over the joke they played. And maybe so. I can't really discount that, except if they were playing a joke, it seems to me they would have let people know by now so as to embarrass me and embarrass the people that got our article published. Now, the usual explanations that are given to dreams like this is that somebody has a faulty memory. One is not remembering things too clearly and events and names get juxtaposed in the memory. But in this case, a man wrote down the dream immediately after she had it. And she also texted the dream and so there was a record of it with Wink. So faulty memory is something that certainly can come into the picture in this line of research, but it doesn't sound like that's a good explanation for uh, this particular series of dreams. And then there's the super psi explanation that Amanda had remarkable clairvoyance skills and she was able to pick information literally out of thin air and put it into a story form that these soldiers never actually sent her the information. But when she got the information from the cosmos, from the collective unconscious, it was valid information. And once again, something like super psi, super ESP, super remote viewing, is a possibility, but to me, the voices from beyond are as a, actually a simpler explanation than the super sight, with all of the names that have to be come about and with no mistakes in the names. Well, again, your listeners can judge for themselves. To me, it's more important to look at and say, look, if this is valid, if this is true, why are the soldiers coming in the dreams? And why did Amanda come to you? Let's go to that last question. Amanda had read many of my articles about dreams. And although this is a very highly controversial topic, she knew that I do not stay away from controversy, that I'm very open-minded about life after death, and I'm very sympathetic to people who have these experiences. Now, why did the soldiers come to Amanda in the dream? Remember that in the dream, they were young and healthy. It's not that they came in their deceased state. They wanted Amanda to know 
that they were in good physical shape when they died and they were in good physical shape on the other side. And they wanted their loved ones to know and the world in general to know, you know, don't cry too much over us. We're very happy where we are. Yes, it's a shame we didn't get to live out our lives, but we're in a very good place now. And we're enjoying our existence and we'll see you there some other day. So it really ends on a very optimistic note that the soldiers did all of this uh, for the edification and the information, the consolation on those who are still on the earthly plane. So there you have it. That's basically the story. And that, uh, again, is something that I presented at many conferences, and it's been written up and publicized. And so I hope it does bring some joy and expectation and positive outlook to many people. Okay, that's the end of the slides, I think. But when I was about 12 years of age, I was in my room at the farmhouse where my parents and I and my sister lived, and my I heard the phone ring. And before the phone rang, I had been going through some very deep depression because I had wanted a set of encyclopedia that my aunt was selling, and my parents, being farmers, didn't have much money, and they couldn't buy me the encyclopedia. And I thought, maybe I have a relative who's rich. And I said, yes, I have one rich relative, and that's my Uncle Max. And I thought, I can't ask my Uncle Max because he's dead. And just then the phone rang, and my mother yelled and screamed and collapsed. Yes, indeed, my Uncle Max, at the age of 40, had a sudden, a sudden heart attack and had died. So that is what got me interested in this. So any reading about precognitive dreams, about telepathy, about precognition, that's something that I started to read. And then when I went to the University of Wisconsin, I learned about the uh, scientific research done with the study of dreams and, and other types of uh, what we call extrasensory perception and clairvoyance, precognition, telepathy. And I was on a student committee that invited the famous J.B. Ryan to give a lecture. It was very controversial because most of the professors in the psychology department had no use for such uh, pseudoscience as parapsychology. But we got a good turnout at the lecture. And so then I did some volunteer work for J.B. Ryan. And then throughout my career, I've never been a full-time parapsychologist, but I've certainly been able to work it into the uh, activities I've been involved in, most especially when I was directing a dream research laboratory at Maimonides Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York. We did a number of dream studies, dreams of pregnant women, for example, dreams of transgender people before the operation and after the operation, uh, dreams of people who were uh, creative, but most of the studies were involving with telepathic dreams, where somebody would try to dream about a picture being sent from another room. And those studies went on for 10 years before the money ran out, but we were able to actually come up with 100 research articles before the time ran out. And so you might say that my career in psychology is veered towards studying intriguing topics that are important and of interest, but that very few other people have the uh, interest in, or because it's bad for their career, they don't want to take the risk. So there you have it. You made a point of mentioning that Amanda had a grandmother of Native American descent. Why did you consider that important? That provided the link between her and Wink, because he's Native American, and the fact that she has some Native American ancestry provided yet another link that I felt might faci have facilitated this interchange. Okay. Question. Parapsychologists are always so cautious um, talking about the survival hypothesis. How do, you, how do your friends in the Na Native American community view this cautious language? 
Well, I've been involved in Native American communities all, virtually all of my life and actually have worked with many Native American shamans over the years. And of course, they think it's uh, ridiculous that uh, informed, intelligent people should question survival because for them it's so obvious. It's something that's part of their life. Some of them communicate with their deceased loved ones. They have special uh, ceremony for the deceased loved ones. They have great respect for their ancestors. And they also, by and large, accept the possibility of reincarnation, that they live several lives and that each life has learned from the life before it. So this is something that's really very common in Native American circles, much more so than in the rest of the population. Yes, and I would add that this is why there are so many Native American spiritual guides in the spiritualist religion. It's because oh, of that close oh, connection. And you what? have several of them that you're in contact with. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, what's this? Um, many of our members have a special interest in physical mediumship. Did you experience this during the times you spent with indigenous communities? Well, I had a friend by the name of Fawn Journeyhawk, who is a pre-shaman, now deceased, lived in the American Southwest. And as part of her healing, she would communicate with uh, people on the other side, and they would give her physical material that she could use in her healing. So when you say physical mediumship, they not only have mental mediumship, she not only gets the messages, but she gets something tangible, something she can touch. She actually gave me a very nice necklace of beads that had come from the other side. And I didn't want to take a chance of them being stolen. So I sent them to the University of Manitoba in Canada. They actually have a collection of what we call apports, physical objects that have appeared uh, with mediums or in different psychic settings. And so when Fawn Journeyhawk uh, gave these to me and I said I was going to put them in safekeeping, she said, good, then many people can share them and make sure that they are checked on every month or so. Sometimes there'll be more stones, sometimes there'll be fewer stones. So sometimes there are changes even after it comes on the scene. Also, I over the years have worked with a medium in Brazil by the name of Amir Amaden, and I have collected many uh, apports from him, and those have all ended up in Canada. Mainly very small polished stones that just come out of nowhere while he's talking to people on the other side. So I, yeah, so I've had a great deal of experience myself with uh, with a few uh, physical mediums and the apports that have resulted. And then, of course, one thing I have not experienced, many of your listeners have heard of ectoplasm, the substance that sometimes appear when mediums are in their altered states. And this, of course, is very fragile, but it's very, very visible, at least for a period of time. Yes, but you've also done research with trans painters, and their work is considered a form of physical mediumship. Oh, that's very interesting, isn't it? Luis Gasparetto is a psychologist in Brazil, but he's also a medium. And I've seen him uh, go into his trance and starting to paint. And I've made contact with Picasso. Mm -hmm. So he comes up with a painting. This looks very much like an early Picasso. There is a special museum in Brazil for his work. And he's not the only one. Uh, I have worked with a medium in Recife, uh, Pierre Jacques, and he actually has a museum in his spiritual center. Very, very spiritual man. People come to his center and they buy the paintings. And this is how he runs his uh, clinic where he helps many, many people in distress. And some of the people from the other side are very well known. Some of them are not so well known. But as a result of the paintings that he has channeled, 
they now have more publicity than they had when they were, they were alive. They were quite ironic. Yeah, that's that's true. That's true. I know some of the names I've seen in the documents, I didn't recognize all the artists' names, um, but now they're getting a new um, recognition. Our next question is, what are some of the most memorable experiences with Rolling Thunder? Give me that book about Rolling Thunder. Well, actually, I happen to have a copy of our book nearby, and I'd recommend that some of your listeners interested in Native Americans look up this book, The Voice of Rolling Thunder, which is a book that his grandson and I wrote about our experiences with this very famous medicine man. I worked with Rolling Thunder for about 20 years up to the time of his uh, passing. And of course, we had many memorable experiences. He was quite a remarkable healer and political activist. One of the experiences which I will never forget is the night that he took me out on the land, his spiritual community, and went to the border of his community where there's woods for forest and rolling thunder started to bark like a wild animal and i thought well i shouldn't be surprised at anything that anything that rolling thunder is doing she was barking 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 and then a pack of coyote came out of the woods and that coyote came right up to us and the leader of the pack was right in front of me so close i could lean down and pat his head if i wanted to I decided not to, but they were that close. And he and Rolling Thunder had a dialogue back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then the pack went back into the woods. Said, Rolling Thunder, what's that all about? And Rolling Thunder said, well, we have a agreement. We will not hunt down and track and kill any of their coyote if they will not attack any of our chickens. Of course, coyote like chickens. And Rolling Thunder never lost a single chicken to Coyote on his property because of this agreement that he and the Coyote had that lasted for many, many years. So that's one of many, many experiences of Rolling Thunder. And as I say, he, I learned a lot from him, quite a remarkable person. And uh, I, where is he now that we need him so badly? But he inspired many, many people. He inspired other healers, other political activists, and so uh, really served his purpose. I should mention that Rolling Thunder was very nonviolent. And it gets one to think, because some people, and even in this day and age, even this week, there have been protests justifiable, but they've involved violence, which is not justifiable. Rolling Thunder would never let his braves, as he called them, his spiritual wires, war engaged in violence. On one occasion, the farmers were cutting down the pinyon nut trees. This is a source of protein for the poor Indians. And some of the young people wanted to uh, get violent when they were cutting down the trees. Rolling Thunder said, no, we'll do this in a nonviolent way. And so one night they went and followed the people who were cutting down the trees and made a video of it. And then after they made the video and the farmers had left, they poured sand into the gas tank of, of the vehicle. So the next morning, they couldn't use them at all. In the meantime, one of the spiritual warriors took the video to Washington, D.C. and took it to a uh, senator in Washington who immediately got, through political means, a court order restraining the farmers from doing any more cutting down of the trees. So this was a nonviolent resolution to something which certainly was a breaking of the law and very racist in its nature. Thank you. That was that's fascinating. And Stanley, okay, I have a question from your friend Steve. And Steve wants to know if you have any recommendations how to enhance these types of communication. I would say, first of all, that people on the other side 
have tried very hard to communicate if they're able to. Remember, all the people on the other side are not able to do it. That's right. Just like people on this side are not able to receive. It takes a special combination. So I would say to somebody who wants their abilities enhanced, why do you want to do it? This is difficult. It's difficult for the people on the other side. It's difficult for you. Make sure that you have clear motives. Don't do it to become famous. Don't do it to get attention. Your motives have to be pure. If you want to facilitate communication between a loved one and a mourner, person left behind, make sure that your motive is very clear and make sure that the results will be very, very honest. So clearing up their motive is one thing. Now, there actually are people who give classes on mediumship. And Steve knows of some of these people. And I know of a few of them on the West Coast. And I've had friends who have gone to some of these classes. And they speak uh, very highly of them. One is a woman who is guided by Hiawatha, again, a Native American channel. And, and a friend of mine actually studied mediumship with her. And once he was able to do it, he thought, okay, I've enjoyed the experience. I've learned a lot. And I'm just let it go with that. He didn't want to pursue it any further, which was fine. He had this experience. He learned a lot. Nobody was hurt. People were helped. So I think that as you know, there are some bona fide mediums who have good reputations, who have volunteered for research, who have good track records. And if they're not teaching the classes themselves, they would probably be able to recommend somebody who is. The one thing that I would not recommend is that people try doing this on their own. Mm. It's not something that you read a cookbook for and go out and start cooking. This is a very, very skilled and delicate operation. And it's something I don't even recommend. If people are bound and determined to try it, fine. Make sure your motive is pure. Make sure you're learning from a person who has credentials. I agree with you 100%. Very good advice. Um, as a person who does teach mediumship for this organization, um, our next question comes from Bill Rainey and he asks, have the Native Americans ever mentioned the Council of the Elders as an afterlife council rather than a physical council? Oh, good heavens, yes. They've mentioned this in, in various forms. In fact, I think there are several councils, uh, councils of elders. These are elders who have passed on and they get, get together and they see the sorry state of the world the very sad state of affairs with Native Americans, what can we do from the other side to be helpful? What can we do to give advice? I mean, you take a look at the Native American communities and what the uh, coronavirus epidemic is doing. These are very, very vulnerable people. And when you're old, when you're living in poverty, you're very susceptible to the virus. And indigenous people throughout the world are susceptible. It's very, very tragic. I'm in touch with communities in South America. And somehow or another, the coronavirus has gotten to these communities with very limited medical help and very limited hospitalization. The current situation is very sad, very tragic. And the Council of Elders is on their agenda, of course. What can we do to give advice? What can we do to help people ride out the storm until a vaccine is available, until help is available. So this is the current crisis. Then of course there's the perennial crisis because Native American communities have a high rate of tuberculosis, high rate of spouse abuse, high rate of, of child abuse, high rate of illiteracy, high rate of unemployment. I mean, I've been in some of these communities and they have wise elders, they have energetic young people, they're doing their best, but just think of the centuries of discrimination. It's gonna take generations for them to climb out of the hole that they've been thrust into. Look what happened when the 
Europeans came to the United States. We talk about the Holocaust in Europe where six million Jews, five million other minorities, about 11 million all were wiped off the face of the earth. Even more than that were probably killed in North and South America when the Europeans came from all the diseases that were brought over. The biggest Holocaust in history is what happened to the Native American communities in North and South America. Millions of people were inhabiting the continents and now there are not millions, there's a couple of hundred thousands. So it's, I, I could go on and on and on. I mean, I see this firsthand and I do what I can in my visits to Native American communities to give them some hope and to give some, some recognition for all of their wisdom. Thank you very, very much. Um, let me just ask the next question. Um, this is from Anne, I think it's McGarity. I, do, um, I don't normally remember my dreams. I've found that occasionally I have a premonition in a dream about something very trivial. Why do you think a dream, for example, about someone I don't even like much, and then the next day I see them? Well, when people have precognitive dreams, dreams about the future, there's all saying they're either about the tragic or the trivial. They're either about something really major, like an upcoming accident or death, or they're about something very unimportant, like a person that somebody hasn't thought of for years that they dream about, and then sure enough, the person pops up by accident the next day. And nobody knows for sure why this is so, but I'll tell you one of the theories. If a person has a propensity for precognitive dreams, they really have to keep that ability moving and going. And if there's no tragedy on the horizon, they have to come up with something maybe relatively unimportant just to keep that trait, just to keep that potential tuned up so it can be there when they really need it. So look at it as a warming up exercise. And then of course we have many precognitive dreams that we completely forget. But they do prepare us for ultimate uh, bad news and every once in a while for good news too. Very good, very good. Here's a question. Why do you keep going back to Brazil? Oh, I've been to Brazil 30 times. Wow. I go back to Brazil because I keep in, being invited back to Brazil. So oh, okay. that. I don't have much money, so I have to go where the invitations are. And uh, the Brazilians and I get on very, very well together. And I was just in Brazil last year. Actually, I was able to take some family members to Brazil for the first time. And I was at three different conferences in three different cities. I was able to speak my limited Portuguese at some of the conferences. I was able to do my family members or friends of mine in Brazil. Many, many psychic people, some mediums were there. And... Uh, and so I have a lot of good memories about Brazil. Also, I do research in Brazil. I've written up a lot of these cases. I've written up stories about some of the mediums and some of the psychics, like Amir Amadel, who produced these airports. When I was in Brazil last year, I didn't see Amir in person, but sure enough, I got to the Brasilia where he lives. And before I knew it, there was a pile of stone coming out of nowhere, landing on my feet. Uh, I had my cane with me. We went shopping. We rattled the cane, and Steve Spear, who was with us, heard something inside the cane. We opened up the cane. There was another polished stone. Every day that we were in Brasilia, Amir had given us a little polished stone or crystal as some gift saying, I know you're still there. I'm, I'm watching you. So a lot of these mediums have a sense of humor, especially in Brazil. Yes, that's very true. Yes, Brazil is a really interesting country. I've just been invited there next year myself um, and hope to maybe connect with some spiritual people. Um, so I'm trying to look for more questions. While we're having a break, I was just going to ask uh, Tamar if she had a question. Tamar is an anthropologist and is particularly interested in cross-cultural religion and other aspects. Tamar, do you have something you'd like to ask Stanley? 
Yeah, well, I'm listening with enormous interest, and um, I'm aware of Stanley's incredibly prolific scholarship and cross-cultural experience. And I don't, I'm, I'm formulating a question at some point, but I'll just sit by and listen. Well, Thank while you. you're formulating, I'll bring you up to date. Great. Uh, one reason I keep going back to Brazil is because of the research. And I've published or co-authored uh, or co-edited a number of books and articles about mediums in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And of course, Brazil has such a rich religious and spiritual history that it is, uh, and the mediums are so cooperative that um, they really enjoy participating in the research. And not only the questionnaire research and the interview research, but we actually brought down a portable EEG and connected electrodes to the heads of one of the mediums, uh, Jacques Andrade in Recife, who I mentioned, who channels artists. And when he was in touch with the artist, his brainwaves changed incredibly. It was like he was a different person. Yeah, and yeah. then he started to do his painting. And again, this is not easy to do. We have electrodes pasted to your head and all of that. But they're very eager to volunteer they have these abilities, they're eager to share, they're eager to help science learn from these abilities. And so it's always a pleasure to uh, do work with Brazilians. Also right now, Brazil is especially interesting for research because of the ayahuasca religions that have gotten a great deal of attention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I actually have a Russian friend who's doing an internship with shamans in Brazil and Peru uh, who are using ayahuasca, especially for people who come from all over the world who have post-traumatic stress disorder. And they've been treated by psychiatrists who give them a lot of drugs. The drugs don't really help too much. Sometimes it makes the uh, anxiety worse. But in Brazil, in Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, they're given this mind-altering beverage under guidance very careful guidance, and they're able to work through the trauma in a way that they were not able to do with the psychiatrists and the drug treatment in the United States. Yes, mm -hmm. this paradigm, um, an L LSD in the United States, as well as the ayahuasca, um, that there's such tremendous potential, really, and, and it really leads to a tremendous, um, a tremendously different way of looking at consciousness really a non-materialist way of looking at consciousness. Yes, you're right, you're right. It mm -hmm. took a long time for the LSD therapy to catch on again, and let's hope it doesn't go away, because you're absolutely right. It's a different paradigm, different paradigm. You're not taking drugs to eradicate the effect. You're taking these sacred herbs to enhance consciousness and to help integrate experiences that you have been having. Yeah, and also arguably um, join join into a greater consciousness. Exactly. Articulating with the cosmos, that's that would... This can be a source of great help, that you are not alone. You're connected at a very, very deep level with other people and with other sentient beings. And this can, can tap into that collective unconscious. Then this gives you more potential and more resources to deal with. You're absolutely right. The United States is very individualistic, maybe too much so, but Brazil is more collectivistic and more community oriented, more family oriented in terms of a large family. And so it's very easy for them to think in terms of all our relations as Native Americans say, past, present and future. And by getting contact with greater consciousness, with one mind, you can do wonders in terms of growth and therapy. Thank you. We do have two Brazilians with us today, Stanley. Really? Our, fr our friends, Luis Sergio and Livia. Livia is a doctor working in Brazil. Um, and Luis Sergio works very much with spiritism in Brazil, the Brazilian Spiritist Organization. Oh. Would you like to say hello to Stanley, please? Uh, Luis Sergio and Livia. Uh, we would, and uh, not only hello, but thank you so ah. much. Great oh, work. Tarde. Gosh, yeah. Espiritistas in Brazil? Uh -huh. Sim, sim, sim. 
Yes, and I wonder, unfortunately, the first time I get in touch with your work and I, I'm really amazed, right? And I, of course, I'm going to read it, <laughs> one of the works. And uh, thank you so much for your lecture for us. It was very interesting. I, I've had dreams, very interesting. My yeah. dreams are like into premonitional dreams, right? I could be here talking to, to you about these dreams and very interesting. But your cases in your dedication is something and I got very touched when you talked about Native Americans and their situation in your work to help them have a better uh, better world, better life. Thank you so much and thank you for the remarks about my country and about the people here. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed, I guess uh, it's uh, in our country, mediumship is something much more spread out in, in terms of uh, acceptation, even in some uh, dogmatic religion fields, right? Yes. But that's it. Well, I think we are here to try to research and get in touch with this. It's a very, I think it's a very magical country, although all the confusion, all the situation, because there are lots of different people in my country. It's a cross-cultural country, as they say. You have lots of different people, lots of different races. But on the other hand, I think it helps us to get more used to fraternity and to living with uh, many different kinds of people at the same time. I think it's- What a, city are you from? Hmm? What I, I'm city? Belo, are you? Belo Horizonte. Belo oh, Horizonte. Yes, Minas Gerais. Minas Gerais, been, yeah. Belo Horizonte, I've been there many, many times, and especially like the caves, the grotto. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Makinen. No. Yes, but I am fortunate I've never met you here, Stanley, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's impressive because I'm very into this field and I've never met you here. Next time, please let me know it, right? Oh, of course, yes. Get mm -hmm. together. You and uh, Susan, too, right? If you come in here to Brazil, Susan, come down here. We're going to talk. Oh, yeah. I'll have to see how far you are. I think I'm going to Rio this time. About 300 kilometers, right? Okay. Right. Well, we've come up to the end of our time with Stanley. Stanley, I'd like to thank you so much for giving us this wonderful, wonderful insight into your work. And Susan, thank you very much for facilitating this and for My bringing pleasure. Stanley to us. Um, is there anybody who'd like to thank Stanley on behalf of the group? Okay, am I unmuted? Yes, you are. Oh, Stanley, thank you so much. I also was not aware of your work until today, but I've already ordered the Rolling Thunder book, and I thank plan you. to look into all of your work. And I'm so, you kept describing your teachers and mentors and saying how extraordinary each of them was, but to me, you are extraordinary. And I thank you so much for sharing with us today. I sure that I will research a lot of what you've done and thank you so much for your contribution. You're so welcome and again I want to recommend that listeners and viewers subscribe to the Afterlife Reports which comes out every week and which is a source of great information and inspiration for me. Stanley, I want to thank you uh, for this really wonderful presentation. I know it's just a small piece of what you write about, think about, talk about, and um, just uh, giving us um, an entry into this work uh, for many, the, for the first time. Um, I really, really want to thank you. And it's so clear um, from your work and your life that you have been so incredibly devoted to the subject far beyond what an academic psychologist would ever be and going really beyond the bounds of 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 belief and going beyond um, the bounds of science uh, you know the established established science and so for that we all thank you um, and uh, I for one am going to read um, uh, some more of your books I've read the dream the the shorter anthology of the dream so I look forward to more thank so thank you on behalf of all of us thank you 